Okay, we ready? Yeah. All right. So hello, everyone. Welcome to the first Global Network Connect webinar discussion. Uh, today, we'll be uh, speaking with four experts from four member schools. First is Commissioner West. She's the Director of Executive Education at the University of Cape Town Graduate School of Business. Uh, then we have Yongxia Feng, uh, Associate Professor at Remnant Business School. And we have uh, Darren Baker, Assistant Professor for Business and Society at the University College Dublin. And we have Jen McFadden, who is Associate Director of Entrepreneurial Programs here at Yale SOM. And we're going to be talking about gender bias in the workplace and what we can do about it. So if you have questions at any time, uh, please submit them via the chat feature uh, on the menu, and we'll do our best to get them answered. Um, well, let's get started. So the, the 2017 Global Network Survey showed that women consistently face uh, conflicting signals about their societal and professional roles. So Commissioner, you've held roles mentoring students through different phases of their career, uh, particularly in your role with Exec Ed. Uh, can you talk about your experience of how both men and women are facing these challenges at different stages of their career? Thanks, Matt. Um, I have, I, on a daily basis, I encounter and interact with really brilliant, smart, um, and hardworking, both men and women. And um, it's always interesting to hear their perspectives on gender bias. Some of the key things that I have found over the six years that I've been working um, with executives at the business school is that for women, the, the challenges haven't changed. They pivot around a few key things um, where women are employed into a job and um, with all their, their entire skill set, they, they really, really, um, you know, they have all the academic qualifications and they sit there and they're ready to, um, to to actually step in and step up. But um, they are often met with challenges around um, some of their colleagues not expecting them to succeed. And that comes across in the way that, that, that they are treated in the organization. Or um, there's another conversation around getting the right kind of support so that they can actually advance in their careers. Um, some of the women have found that they struggle with getting the right support to uh, be heard in their organizations. Um, um, many of the women that I've chatted with and mentored have said that they have a place at the table, but often they don't feel heard. So they come into some of our courses to learn skills to be able to communicate in a more powerful way. Um, and yet when we sit with them and we have conversations, we see that their communication style is perfect. I think it's what's happening on the other side and who's receiving the, what they are saying. Um, that is a challenge. And, um, you know, in terms of generational um, experiences, uh, I've, I have a very interesting mentee right now who's 26 years old. And um, she said to me that, you know, she stepped into the corporate world um, after uh, getting her master's degree. And then her expectation was that there are so many women in her industry that have gone before her that are in senior roles. Her expectation was that she wouldn't be met with gender bias. She wouldn't be met with, you know, blocks in her, in, in her path or obstacles. Um, and she, she stepped in there confidently, expecting to be embraced for everything that she brings into the organization. But what she's found is that she's become more and more frustrated because she hasn't been given the platforms that she needs, she, she would hoped for. Um, and so she says, while it's easier because it's easier and it's difficult at the same time because she's come in knowing um, she's very aware about uh, gender biases and she's very aware about her uh, expectations from the role and, and the organization. She's just finding that she doesn't have the right kind of support right now um, so that she can actually thrive in that environment. Great. So, perfect. Uh, so Jen, um, you're the assistant director of uh, entrepreneurship and an entrepreneur yourself, and you, you were talking about that before we got started. Um, you know, what are some of the challenges for women uh, who are launching a new venture? Sure. So I'll talk about this, six, you know, specifically around where I focus, um, which is high tech, high growth U.S. based ventures. I want to caveat that since this might be an international audience. Um, so there are a lot of barriers that you see that are really systemic barriers to women who are trying to go down the venture-backed uh, startup path that keep 
from being successful in those roles. And so this really starts with, you know, with college, where you see people who are interested in STEM fields tend to be male. And so there's a lack of diversity there, in particular in computer science, although we had historically higher numbers earlier, um, once we hit kind of the late 90s, those numbers started to dip pretty precipitously. So if you're looking at technical co-founders or people who have the technical skills to start different types of ventures, it tends to still be a, a male-dominated pipeline of people. Um, if you look then also, though, at some of the other larger systemic issues that are really rooted in, in the venture capital industry itself, it is an industry that's highly insular, where people who are recruited into investing roles within venture funds tend to come from networks within, you know, of those people who are existing in those funds. So the stats around, um, around venture capital in the U.S. are, are pretty terrible still. So only 9% of the U.S.-based VCs um, and venture capitalists in the U.S. who have check writing capabilities for funds that are over $25 million are women. Um, you see underrepresentation really spans across all uh, size and scale and, and stage focus of different venture capital funds. So 74% of VC funds have no female VCs who have check writing capabilities at all. Only 5% of those funds actually have um, gender representation. And so, you know, you may have a great idea, you may get down the path, you may be acquiring users, you may be doing all the things that are correct, but your opportunity in trying to go to those venture capitalists who, again, those connections and, and entrees into the VC world are through those personal networks. You're stymied immediately. And then if you think about it, just from a systemic perspective of who's taking on those, you know, the, the VP plus roles within tech companies as they grow past 100 people, and, you know, founders tend to recruit those people at the earliest parts of their team, you know, when they're 10 and under, um, from, again, their personal networks. And so if you're not baking that diversity in at the earliest levels of your company, so by the time you hit 20 people, if you don't have any women or pe people of color or, or any of the other identifiers that we all use, you end up with what is called in the industry diversity debt. So it's really difficult to unwind that and then create as you go to 50 or 100 employees an inclusive environment so that if you've got an engineering team that's got you know, five white guys on it um, and you try to bring in a female, it's, you've, you've created an environment already that's not terribly inclusive to that individual at times. And so then if you look at the systemic issues, this is all kind of complex, so I'm gonna go for another two minutes and then I'll pass on the baton. Um, but if you look at what those types of rules then lead to in the industry, they lead to either you know, VP level C-suite positions at other technology companies, they lead to private wealth, you know, the earliest uh, employees of the companies are the ones who tend to forego salary and retain equity. And if there's an exit opportunity, they then end up with um, capital that they can deploy either as, you know, an angel investor or in some other capacity. Uh, that also gives them the opportunity and the personal freedom and flexibility to not have to go after venture capital funding themselves. And so it just provides all these opportunities. And then if you're looking at from a VC recruiting perspective, what they're looking for in the people that they're bringing in as those investing partners, they tend to be the people who have the highest levels of operating experience at funds or have some level of technical expertise. So there are all of these complex factors that we can get into as we go through that really contribute to this issue with females in particular. Um, and again, focusing on high tech, high growth, US-based entrepreneurship. Um, Darren, um, uh, your work has focused on unconscious interpersonal dynamics in the workplace. Um, what is some practical advice you'd give to some uh, organizations trying to deal with uh, unconscious gender bias? Sure. Um, so I think there's probably three things that came to mind um, with that question. The first one was around um, busting myths, um, busting common myths that um, employees and organizational leaders use um, in the workplace. Um, terms such as uh, confidence, terms such as resilience, 
and can often be uh, very problematic. Uh, Actually, Darren, if you don't mind leaning in a little bit, there are yeah. some people are having trouble hearing you. No problem. Um, so the first one I mentioned was around busting common myths in the web page. So trying to tackle um, some of the inequalities that emerge from the use of terms such as um, confidence or resilience in the web page and how they can be problematic. Uh, particularly for women. And I mention terms like um, confidence because often uh, they have uh, very masculine um, attributes associated to those terms. And of course, when they're used in specific organizational contexts like assessments of employees, and um, it can obviously lead to the disadvantage um, of women. Another, another area that came to mind was around creating uh, particularly confidential spaces uh, for women. Um, what, what, I, what I found from my own research is that women um, have a tendency to, um, to, to sideline their mistreatments and blame themselves. And I think if organizations can create those confidential spaces for women to, um, to speak candidly about their own experiences and mistreatments, that can really help them um, to, to, uh, to tackle some of the issues they, they have. Hey, hey Darren. Um... We're getting a bunch of notes saying it's it, it, it's kind of like an echo around when, when you're talking. I, I can hear you, but some people are having trouble. Is it possible to um, adjust your, your microphone or move the... Um, all, I can, all I can do perhaps is just take out my headphones. And... Yeah, let's try that. And maybe that will work a little better if you don't mind. Is that better? Oh, much better. Oh, yeah. yeah. So if you wouldn't mind like maybe re reiterating that last point one more time. Sorry, people were, yeah. were asking about it. <laughs> No problem. So I mentioned uh, the first point, which was around uh, busting those common myths in organizations. So tackling terms that perhaps have, um, you know, of, often very masculine attributes attached to them, like confidence. And um, the second part was around creating confidential spaces for women. And what I found from my own research is that women um, have, a, have a tendency to, to um, sideline some of their own mistreatment and blame themselves. And of course, if organizations can create um, confidential spaces for women to, uh, to share their experiences more candidly, then of course, organizations can learn um, what really is impeding and, and, and uh, disadvantaging women in the workplace. And the third thing that came to mind was around um, sort of more collective action, I think, for women. Um, you know, as I mentioned, um, women often see um, hindrances as the, in the workplace as issues that they have to contend with on their own. So the sense mm -hmm. that um, they, they have to uh, themselves, you know, sort of stand up and, and um, ensure their own um, equality. And I think if, if organisations can support women, and um, to, to build relationships, both with the women in their organization, and perhaps um, from a sectoral basis, that might help um, women to, um, to have a greater voice in, in, in reshaping organizational systems. Great, that's great tips. Uh, Youngxia, uh, so we're jumping across the world to, to Beijing now. Um, yeah. you, you've done research on changing organizational culture. Um, what is ne needed to make gender equality part of corporate culture in, in China and also more broadly? Uh, well, um, back to your question, I think here we, we probably uh, prefer to say gender diversity rather than gender bias. <laughs> so in the company, uh, generally females uh, in our MBA case, they play the role in the functional areas like finance, or human resource management, or some uh, public relations. So which means they combine the team with the uh, male gender in the organization level. And as to the corporate culture, um, actually when the, uh, in, in China, I think the corporate culture itself is more functional, which means they act as a role to uh, fulfill the strategy. So the um, such kind of functional role uh, actually is quite business driven sometimes. So uh, I think in the corporate culture uh, components, sometimes the gender issue probably is not included in that at, at this stage, maybe in future. <laughs> 
Okay, so, so now I have some uh, broader questions for the group. And so whoever wants to join in, just feel free to go first and then uh, start a conversation. So, um, you know, what are some effective strategies uh, for contending with gender bias for a woman who's just out of business school or a woman or a man who's just out of business school and how they can uh, help with that? Um, I'm happy to chime in here. So um, I think it, it starts from the individual level and, and an individual that's stepping into the space. It's cre it starts with awareness, both for men and women, because I think it's a collective um, a challenge that we have and we both have to be, we have to acknowledge that there's this, this this gap and this problem. Um, and now that we know that it's, we're talking about it so often, it's about, okay, how do we build this bridge and what do we do? Um, so as an individual, being able to um, speak about it, you know, it's, it's always a challenge, I think, for women to, ch to, to step up and say, you know, I don't enjoy how you're treating me. Um, I don't enjoy that, um, you know, you, the minute I speak, you speak over me and uh, you don't give me a chance to finish. Um, I don't enjoy that my, um, the, um, the suggestions that I'm putting forward are being ignored when I put them forward. But when my male counterpart actually suggests the exact same thing in a different way, it's embraced and it's celebrated. Um, and then, um, so, so it's actually, in order, but in order to do that, in order for a woman to be able to do that, it talks to what Darren was saying about creating safe spaces. And that can only be done by your leadership of an organization. And so leadership of an organization is really important in how they want to shift the way, you know, this whole gender bias, um, to, sh to shift the, the conversation about it so that it can be an open space where people can actually easily speak about it. So if there's a constant consistency in conversation around there is gender bias, what are we going to do about it, and how are we going to address it? It creates an open space, a, a comfortable space, a safe space for everyone to talk about it. Um, where a male, uh, and, uh, you know, a male colleague can step in and say to another male colleague who's interrupted their, their female colleague to say, can you please just hang on a second? I'm really interested in what she's, she has to say. So, um, please, can you give her an opportunity? So I don't think it's just an in, at an individual level. It really is a collective. Um, and we have to start working together from at every single level of an organization. I can jump in as well. Um, I think a couple of things that we do here at the university are relevant from uh, just in general, as, as educators, how we should be thinking about framing this as well. We started an organization, we at Yale, about a year and a half ago, that focuses on women innovators and entrepreneurs across Yale's campus in coordination with a larger innovation center. It's centrally located at Yale. And part of our goal in that is going back to what Darren was saying around confidence and resiliency is helping women while they're at a university acquire a set of skills, whether they're undergraduate or graduate students, that will enable them to feel empowered to stand up and say exactly those types of things when they're sitting in those meetings. And so we feel if we can pull people through the entrepreneurial process that exposes them to risk, it exposes them to failure, it exposes them to talking to customers and getting out of kind of this shell that they may be in. And if you look at some of the research around entrepreneurial self-efficacy um, and, and gender in particular, um, there are strategies that you can use to help women build the skills while they are here as students and that you can build once you get out by working on side projects that allow you to then feel more empowered to use those, that voice in those um, situations. And then also that gives you the technical skills to be able to say, here's an example of when I have done this and please take me seriously, um, which I think is also a big, a big deal. Um, I think the other thing that is critically important because it is, has such compounding and cumulative effects, and I think, you know, you shared earlier, Matt, the, the article from the Financial Times today, really understanding as a female, when you're coming out and you're looking at a particular role, what is the salary? What is the average salary? What is the top salary? Not being afraid to ask for that top salary because the cumulative impact of salary and title from that first position, once you're out of a, a, an MBA program over the lifetime of your career is just staggering. So talk to people who are in that role, who are alumni, who are a couple of years out. 
go get all the statistics that you possibly can from the career development office. Um, really understand going into that negotiation um, that it's okay to walk away if you're not getting what you're asking for, uh, I think is really important. Yeah. Um, Great. Um, so the, the next one was just, what are some strategies for preventing okay. uh, gender bias for someone who leads a team and then, you know, at a higher level for someone who leads an organization? And um, Matt, I can start if you um, if you like. Um, one thing that came to mind, and I think something that um, uh, Kushmi mentioned uh, very aptly, was around the role of men. And I think um, we shouldn't ignore that the, the importance um, of of men, um, both in terms of their overrepresentation, particularly high echelons of organisations, but also as, as important change agents agents as well uh, in the equality uh, movement. Um, and I think what organizations should be doing is, is trying to cultivate um, men as gender inclusive um, leaders and supporting them to, to recognize uh, the challenges that women have, how they themselves can support women through you know, celebrating the achievements of women. Um, as Kushmi mentioned as well, calling out um, unfairness in the workplace and supporting uh, women at their level and, and below. Um, and also enable men, men to empathize more. And also as well, demonstrating their own, I suppose, elements of diversity, whether or not it's their responsibilities outside of work in terms of picking up children uh, and sort of demonstrating them to show that, um, you know, women uh, have to leave the workplace early, for instance, um, that's absolutely fine. Can I just add on to that? I think it's important to make those those general HR policies, though, applicable to everybody and not make it specific. So if you look at, there's a, a woman who runs Luminary Labs in New York City, Sarah Holabeck, and she's done a lot of work on what she calls the human company playbook. And it really is this idea of we as human beings should have lives outside of work. How can we set up a, a structure that makes everybody feel like they can have those lives and then lead by example? And so it shouldn't be just like an extended maternity leave, it is, you know, it is parental leave and making those as broad based and applicable to as wide of an audience and getting the buy in from the top um, makes it more generally uh, acceptable across an organization. Yeah, here, actually, back to the first question, I, I'm quite uh, uh, agree with Jennifer's opinion. In Renmin Business School here, uh, we have a lot of uh, activities or programs which help the women students to develop themselves. For example, in our global network, we have more women students, you know, they traveling abroad than the, than the men. The proportion of women is uh, actually is larger. And besides, uh, here we have um, some clubs uh, like uh, uh, running, like uh, reading, like uh, uh, some, you know, taking care of uh, some the uh, disabled people. So in this kind of clubs, the women sometimes are heavily encouraged to play the role as a leader. So actually, I think before they jump out of, uh, out of the business, before they out of the school, we have uh, deliberate, you know, strategy to develop to help women to develop themselves. So in this way, they probably can equip or prepare better to, to face some challenges in future. Yeah. Great, we have, so we have some questions coming in. Um, the first we're gonna, I, is from Raphael and uh, wanted to know, uh, how can we measure the effectiveness of short-term actions in order to support long-term change? if anyone wants to. I mean, I think if you look at some of the work that's being done within the technology sector in Silicon Valley right now, there's a large focus on numbers. And I think, um, you know, for both the, the VC solving that problem side, there's an organization called All Raise, and they are focused on trying to pull as many women into the process of understanding um, fundraising across the board. Um, and there's another organization that I think is great back to 
uh, what Darren was saying before about making sure that you're including men. It's great, and we, and we do a lot of work across the university to have very exclusive environments for women where we're providing opportunities for them to have those private conversations, but then it's equally as important to have role models um, and representation outside of the context of just a female-only um, uh, situation. So uh, there's an organization called Him for Her that's working a lot to pull together uh, sets, small sets of individuals to have dinners to introduce one another to um, people like Steve Case or Danny Myers uh, who have access to those sets of, of connections. Um, and so trying to pull as many people through those process, that's something that you can measure. I think the problem comes in saying, if you look at, you know, kind of the Google numbers that came out, I guess it's probably five or seven years ago now, and a lot of the policy that was driven after that, it's really tough to say specifically, all right, we can look at our diversity numbers and across all of Google, we have 10% African American women or, which they don't, I don't think, but, um, you know, have these stats that are very much uh, kind of across an organization versus specific to a group. So to the extent that you can make sure that those numbers are specific to a group, make sure that they are public within your organization that people are held accountable. So if you're looking at data and you're saying, all right, I have a team, I'm managing that team, and I'm looking at the three men on the team and the two women on the team, and the men are making this much and the women are making that much, why is that occurring? Um, and tracking some of that uh, against metrics that you're creating that are as you know, data-driven and unbiased as possible <laughs> to, to the degree that you can. Um, so it's not just the the diversity piece, it's, you know, trying to find ways to make sure that once people are in that organization, they're being moved through a funnel in a way that's allowing them to take on those higher level leadership roles. Uh, I agree with you, Jen, and here in South Africa, we have um, an organization called the 30% Club. I know it's an international organization, and um, the 30% Club is actually helping organizations to get 30% of their senior leadership, uh, uh, up to, uh, women on 30% of their leadership, basically. Um, and basically, um, what they're doing is they are supporting organizations to understand their stats, firstly, because if you don't know what, what, you, um, what you're working with, you can't measure it. And you don't know if what your goal is, you can't measure it. So it's helping organizations realize that, okay, they they need to have more women in senior leadership. They, they're getting the leadership to commit to actually within a certain period of time that they are going to make sure that their talent management team is going to recruit so that you can have those senior managers or those senior leaders, women leaders in the organization by a specific time. And that's what you can measure. Um, and also what they're doing is they have started running something called boardwalks to prepare women to step into the boardroom. Um, and what's phenomenal about this is that any woman that's interested in you know, ascending the corporate ladder can attend this boardwalk and sit with a woman that has served on a board for many years and ask the relevant questions that most women have about you know, what is it like, how do I get there, what is it that I have to, how do I need to prepare myself and what sort of skill set do I need to get there? Um, and also to the point of, you know, preparing women, like in, in Renman, at uh, UCT Business School, we have programs that are specifically develop, uh, developed and um, uh, led by women that have been in leadership positions, or we've had the senior VP of, um, of uh, Johnson & Johnson, one of the companies that we work with, to... Um, come in and talk about what is it like to be in a senior role and how are they doing, what are they doing within their organization to change um, the environment so that more women can come through the ranks and how are they supporting that? Um, yeah. one, thing, one thing that I, um, that I thought of, um, and I, I'm not sure if I quite got the full question, but for me it seems like, you know, equality change is, is fundamentally a medium to long-term uh, change project. You know, I think there are short-term initiatives that you can um, implement, uh, but I don't think they deliver the, the full whack. You know, we have to be looking at a much broader horizon. And I think, you know, that therefore organizations have to have equality at the center 
a fundamental aspect of their strategy. And of course, underpinning that um, with, a, with a thorough accounting uh, project, you know, looking at their true bottom line, the contribution that um, equality is making to the uh, stability and the price. <laughs> Uh, their organisation. So for me, it, it, the question is is fundamentally about long termness and, and how organisations can make a, um, a, a fundamental aspect of their strategy over the long term. Uh, so actually, in, in the context here, I think we have one experience of uh, sharing that is the norms. For example, in our university, at the, the uh, pres uh, president level, for example, there should be some women. So we have some proportion distribution. Uh, in the case of our business school, we have a dean a, as a man, but the associate deans, for example, sometimes we have one or two women in the, uh, in the team. And secondly, I think in Chinese situation, um, the man who was born after 1980s, I think they have better uh, attitude or more equal attitude to the gender issue. So th this is uh, quite uh, different uh, from the previous generations. Uh, so when, for example, in our MBA program, some of the students, they um, uh, get educated uh, in a couple. So they, the wife and husband, they uh, both come to the business world to get educated. And then in this way, you know, they are more equal, yeah. The education can change. Sometimes the norms uh, matter, yeah. I think this is a good way to lead into this other question um, that uh, someone sent in when they were registering for the webinar, um, which was, you know, how are corporate attitudes towards gender bias uh, influenced by social change? Um, obviously, here in the United States, we have the whole the Me Too movement going on. Um, and, you know, I, that's had a, vast impact, I think, uh, across all sectors of society and obviously touching business quite a bit too. Um, so yeah, so how are corporate attitudes uh, towards gender bias influenced by social change? I, I mean, I'll, I'll jump in there and just talk about the tech sector. You know, there was an engineer who spoke out earlier um, at Pinterest, uh, Tracy Chow, and she started really calculating numbers and collecting information and pushing this, uh, or making this push for kind of collecting data and making it public around some of these things. I think you can't discount Black Lives Matter, which has been out there for forever and really has impacted some of the more intersectional issues. And then also it's just become more of a topic of conversation. I think you also are seeing just a trend where more women, I think for so long people have played this out as a pipeline issue, and I used the pipeline before for a technical co-founder perspective, but there are plenty of women in the pipeline. It's not a pipeline issue for recruiting into a lot of roles within startups. Um, and so people have kind of hidden behind the pipeline. They've hidden behind the pipeline um, with venture capital. In particular, you have a couple of very prominent VCs in Silicon Valley who four or five years ago spoke out and and really kind of put their foot in their mouths about some of these issues. And so it, it was starting to happen before Me Too, I would say, in the tech sector. And it really was driven by, I think, an increase in the number of people who actually had tech-related roles in organizations across the board and a set of women who just kind of stood up and finally said, enough is enough. Um, but then you see all of the ramifications of this coming down in organizations like Uber, where back to the kind of particularly perfect example of diversity debt, Uber is the perfect example of diversity debt and what happens to your culture if you're not incredibly conscientious about this at the earliest stages. So I'm not sure if it's a chicken egg here in the US in, in that I think a lot of the Me Too work actually came out of stuff that was going on in the tech sector um, at the same time, or, or it was all going on at the same time. So I'm not sure Me Too was the the catalyst for some of the conversation, but certainly it is, it's a big topic now, so. Um, I, think, I think from my perspective, um, I'd echo much of what has been said uh, by Jennifer, but I, I think my overall response would be um, that businesses are slow, or very slow to respond to uh, social change uh, and social dynamics. And, um, you know, we had, um, 
you know, the last 20 or 30 years, the, the dominance of the, the business case, particularly for equality. Um, and although there have been changes, I mean, we, do, we have seen a great proportion of women in work, and that, that is a positive thing, that's a good thing. And nevertheless, uh, the change has been slow. And I think, um, you know, we're in a situation now where obviously we, we do see quite fundamental shifts in broader, the broader social political environment, particularly in the US and the UK. And um, I don't really see organizations fundamentally responding to, to those changes uh, in a fast enough way. Yeah, and I should add, you know, again, I'm focused on high tech, high growth VC. I think if you, VC backed ventures, I think if you look across the board at, you know, investment banking and consulting in the US, some consulting firms have been um, more progressive in their views on some of this, but I would say there's, there's still larger hurdles in some industries here. Manufacturing is another big one um, that you, you know, the conversation is occurring very much in Silicon Valley in New York City and Boston and top cups across the country. Um, it, it may not be occurring at Fortune 500 companies as, as frequently. Um, I think the, the pace of change there, because you have larger organizations and because you have uh, a set of people at the top, if you look at the funnel, who, who are, are very happy to be where they are and don't necessarily sometimes want to see change, um, it's more difficult. Yeah, actually, uh, Me Too uh, movement has do have some impact upon our society, uh, especially for women who was born after 1990s. Um, I think they are more brave. Uh, previously, probably women feel very shameful to speak out this kind of uh, sexual harassment. But because of the education and because of the internet, the young ladies in China nowadays are more brave. So sometimes they use the media and then they, they speak it out. And in this way, I, I think it really help somewhat to, to, to make improvement. So this kind of, uh, Me Too movement do have impact upon the women awareness of self-protecting in the, in the, you know, in the occupation. Yeah, especially for women uh, who are much younger, very well edu educated, and also uh, internet, you know, spread the news very quickly. So they will have some self-organizing kind of groups to support each other. Yeah. So, so uh, another question I had was, um, are, are there examples of organizations that are handling issues with um, gender bias particularly well? Are there some uh, perhaps um, uh, standouts that would be worth mentioning and uh, that come to mind and you know perhaps since we're all in different parts of the world there might be something that you know might be different in different parts. So uh, I'll start in here that we have a financial institution um, that's um, has been really focused on um, on equalizing the playing field for women here. It's um, and and I think in different parts of the the organization, it's it's more um, visible than in others. But um, one of the key things that they've looked at is um, you know working mothers and working fathers. And when um, in in South Africa generally you have a six four to six month maternity period. But when it comes to paternal um, pater paternity leave, it's generally like three to four days. So, um, you know, so they've looked at um, their paternal leave policies and, uh, or, and that, that they've increased that to one month for, for dads and then they can actually um, decide, you know, how they want to spread it out over what pe period. The other thing that this organization has done is that they've introduced a crash at um, the organization. It's uh, in, in Cape Town, uh, where, we, where I'm at, it's, there are about 3,000 employees. And um, so they've introduced a crash to the school, uh, to the, the organization, so that parents can get to work. They know that their children are safe. They, they can access their kids and get to them 
um, at lunchtime if they want to see them. And if a child is ill, they have nurses on the ground as well. And then the parents are close enough to their kids. So they don't have to worry about, you know, having to take time off. And this is a real worry for some parents and specifically moms because, um, you know, they, they end up worrying that if they have children um, or they have to plan how, when they have children in their careers because it's going to affect their growth and the next rung of the ladder that they want to climb. And here this organization is particularly focused on let's help our, help our employees to take that worry about, you know, let's take care of their children so they can get on with their work and they can still have the opportunities that they want to have so that they can be working moms and, you know, we can support them. And I think that's, that's wonderful. Um, yeah. one thing, oh, <laughs> sorry. Go ahead. I am um, <laughs> just, I, I just had a, just a few comments. Um, my, my own um, area of research um, has primarily been um, within the financial uh, services sector. And um, one of the, the key challenges that they face as, as a sector is moving and supporting women beyond middle management. So we have gender parity. Um, up until around the middle management rung. Um, so there's probably lots of really great work going on there, but unfortunately beyond that, the, the sector is really struggling to retain uh, talented women. And in the UK in particular, um, the, uh, the, the Conservative government uh, introduced um, a bill which forced all organisations of a certain size to disclose their gender pay gap. And actually, um, we had the first wave of, of results uh, 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 last year. And um, the, the actual uh, median uh, gender pay gap in the sector is far more than anyone expected. So there's a great deal of work still to do, um, certainly within the financial services sector. That's not to say that there aren't uh, specific projects and the right intentions uh, there within the sector, but certainly um, the, there is a lot more work to do. Um, I would say in the US you have uh companies like AppNexus, which is a technology company inside of New York, they've done a really good job and have been very open in their strategies to recruit women in particular into the engineering team. So if you're looking for resources, they have a great set of resources and have certainly provided a great example. Patagonia is a classic example. They have on-site daycare. They've had very uh, open policies regarding you know, work-life balance for a long time. I think if you look at some of, again, focusing on the, the Silicon Valley side of the world, um, some of the venture capitalists within Silicon Valley are really, or people who are leading companies. So you have Reid Hoffman, uh, who's at Greylock now, you have tweeners at LinkedIn have been very vocal in this movement to try to increase in the, the gender equity across the sector. Um, you have organizations like Project Include, which also has a ton of resources around diversity and inclusion on their website. They have a comprehensive list of if you're looking for that list of to-dos, like what is a sponsorship program? Um, how do you increase the pipeline? How do you proactively measure some of these things? Uh, that was an organization that was started by Tracy Chow, who I mentioned, and Ellen Powell, who was at Kleiner Perkins and sued Kleiner Perkins for gender discrimination and lost. But again, from the cultural movement perspective, and that was before Me Too, that was definitely one of the precipitating moments in Silicon Valley around a lot of the conversations uh, in, in terms of gender equity. So you do see a set of organizations that are really leading, again, going back to that human company playbook. Sarah went out and interviewed a, a number of different organizations to ask about their specific policies. So if you go on that website, there's a link to um, a, a deck that includes the list of companies that you can go and kind of review what they've done. So First Round Capital has a ton of resources on their website as well if you're a founder in terms of, of how do you think about structuring these things from the earliest um, moments of your company. So. Yeah, in Chinese situation, uh, the uh, state-owned companies here, uh, most of the state companies, they have a benefit policy which uh, uh, help the uh, women who give birth to children so the benefit policy here is very well uh, designed. Besides, uh, in, in recent years, we have the so-called employee ad programs. So I think this probably can somewhat help to alleviate this kind of uh, gender uh, inequality. 
you know, for some state-owned company, they design the human resource uh, management policies, especially the benefit, so which can help, yeah, somewhat. <clears throat> so what is, what is perhaps the role of regulation in solving some of the disparities in the workplace? Or does the solution need to come from within businesses themselves? I think if you look at it historically, a lot of, at least in the U.S., um, policies were based in the 70s and 80s on, on fear um, and on regulation. And so a lot of that was incredibly ineffective. So I think it, it really needs to come, the buy-in needs to come from the founder, the CEO, the C-suite, and the VP levels uh, instead of the government coming in and saying, you know, Here's, here's some stats that you have to abide by. I think it's, it's a really interesting question, Matt. I think um, in the UK context, um, what we've had over the last uh, 10 years has really been the threat of um, legislation or government intervention, uh, particularly around uh, the representation of women uh, at senior levels. Um, we had, uh, for, for a number of years, um, the Lord Davies report, uh, which was a, a report done uh, by the House of Lords, uh, which tracked the proportion of women at boards. And it put a lot of pressure um, on FTSE 100 uh, companies to increase um, their representation of women on boards. And it worked very effectively without governments having to uh, intervene. Um, however, there, are, there, there, have been, there has been a slight uh, sort of dip in that the last year or two since the termination of that report. Um, as we've seen in the last few years with, with, the, um, with government um, requiring or obliging organisations to disclose, for instance, a gender pay gap, that's starting to put a lot of pressure on organisations to address uh, fundamental aspects of, of equality, particularly around representation, of course, representation indicating or balances, imbalances in representation indicating, of course, um, the uh, pay uh, imparity. So, um, um, I, personally, I think uh, government plays a, a really important role in um, shaping organisations who have, um, over the last year's uh, privilege, perhaps, uh, business uh, discourses or business imperatives for gender parity, which haven't really fundamentally changed uh, the, the, the dynamics um, around this issue. Yeah, uh, in Chinese situation, we, we do have a kind of uh, uh, government policy, uh, which named as uh, the, the stage between 2011 to 2080, uh, the uh, state council especially emphasized the equal education opportunity for women uh, and also some rules um, actually uh, regulate the companies when they do the employment practices. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Um, um, in South Africa, we have uh, the Employment Equity Act and uh, women have been identified as previously disadvantaged because they haven't had access to opportunities. Um, so that's part of our recruitment policies that, um, you know, that we have to employ and we have to exercise when we are um, recruiting for any role in organizations in South Africa. Um, and I think that government, government plays an a very, very important role in, um, in policy de development. But what's more important is that how it is executed. You can have very, very good policies, but you can have very, very bad practices. And I think that's exactly, uh, you know, to your point, Darren, is that, you know, you have, to, you have to actually make sure that those policies are executed on. Um, don't, you know, there are lots of policies that we just have because it's good to have. And it's, it's about the fear. That's, um, that's why we actually, you know, we decide, okay, we, we need to do something and we're scared about what's going to happen if we don't. But actually, implementation is really important. Um, and that's where it comes down to what Jen was saying, that the, the, drive, the drivers and the change agents have to be the leaders of organizations. So I think it's definitely a multi-pronged approach government and organizations have to work very closely together to, to create gender parity. We're having some back and forth on the, the chat and I've received a couple of questions sent to me. 
um, asking about, you know, are there countries that have achieved greater progress with gender equity than others? And maybe something to be learned from, uh, you know, how those countries have performed? Well, on the African continent, uh, Rwanda has um, definitely been a trailblazer when it comes to their policies around gender equality. Um, and uh, there's some really, really int interesting articles about um, what they have done and how they've gone about doing it. But most importantly is that they have some, the, the Rwandan government and corporate are working very closely to change the face of leadership in their country. So um, I think that would be a good example. Um, I can't share more in-depth knowledge about it, um, you know, but definitely if you want to read more about Rwanda, I think that would be a great example. I think from a, a European perspective, obviously, uh, Norway is often cited as uh, um, one of the more um, uh, progressive uh, countries uh, with regards to gender equality and um, the, the Norwegian government introduced uh, gender quotas um, a number of years ago and there, there's, there's often quite mixed um, results around this. I mean I think uh, first and foremost that did um, increase significantly the representation. I think it was around 40 or 45 percent of women on boards. Um, and so the representation of women increased significantly. There was also evidence to suggest that there was a trickle down effect of that. So organizations were more inclined to develop um, uh, female talent pipelines in order to, um, in order to achieve the objective, the uh, executive board objective in the medium to long term. So there were some really positive um, outcomes or results of uh, that policy in Norway. However, there is there is some uh, potential negative aspects in that it led to what they often call um, golden skirts, women who were often uh, used by multiple organisations to sit in their boards. That's often one argument that's used to show perhaps the, the, uh, the, the government intervention or it wasn't as effective. But I think the, the results overall show a, a, a positive trickle down effect in, 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 in forcing or shaping uh, organisations to address female pipeline, which I think is one of the, one of the issues we have in organisations at the moment. Um, this is probably a question for Jen first, and then I think Youngshia might be interesting to hear your perspective. Uh, what role does entrepreneurship play in terms of women's economic empowerment? Sure. I, I just want to really quickly address, someone was asking me to repeat the sites that I mentioned. So oh, yeah. um, AppNexus is a company in New York City. Uh, tech Inclusion is an organization that deals specifically with inclus inclusion in the tech space, obviously. They have a ton of video content from the conferences that they've done. So if you Google that, you'll find a lot. First Round Capital has a lot of really good articles on their first round review. And then Project Include has a list of a ton of resources. And then we at Yale, we also have under research, we have uh, a, a, a link to hundreds of articles, so you can, you can go deep. Um, yeah, I mean, I think that's our whole, from, from my personal perspective on what drove me to start a company that teaches women how to code, what has driven me to launch the organization here we at Yale, is that I personally think that it, the economic empowerment and all of these other questions around creating more human companies uh, is, is critical. And so if we're giving students those skills uh, while they're at university or if we're encouraging people to launch projects while they're working that are on the side um, and they, we're giving them the set of skills that will allow them to be A, either a founder or B, one of those first 10 employees, um, I think we will radically change back to what Darren was saying before. This is a long-term game. It's a game for me. It's not a, in two years, we're going to fix this. It's 10, 20 years down the road. We might see some really great impact by having um, a larger number of women going out and actually launching companies and therefore then having the ability to decide what those policies look like within the companies and, and different networks of individuals that they're pulling in for, for the first 10 or 20 employees that they have. 
that being said, you should still consider diversity if you're a female founder and in that first 20 people, because you'll have the same problem with just a different set of people if you don't really think deeply about it. Um, but I, I view it very much as an econ economic empowerment play. I think the skills that you learn by going out and trying to actually launch something um, allow you to, even if you fail, be a better employee and be uh, a more productive member of a team. So. Mm -hmm. Yeah, um, actually in Chinese situation, I think generations matter a lot. So for people who was born after 1980s and 1990s, they are more uh, well educated. So, um, so like BBC recently has shoot a TV series, especially reporting the generation uh, who was born after 1980s. So people are more entrepreneurial, especially women. Uh, for example, in our MBA program, um, some of the women, they, they have the kind of economic freedom. So they, they are more free to, to launch their own business. Uh, in my own case, for example, I used to translate a book uh, about Hillary Clinton. Uh, that is before you know, Trump has become the president. So after translating this book into Chinese, actually I have been invited to several forums talking about women leadership, especially in Shanghai. Um, they have a kind of SHE power uh, kind of community which help the women to do their business, to do the, edu to do the training and to develop the leadership. So I think the, the generations are quite an issue in, in Chinese situation. Uh, in, my, in our business school, you see, in the graduate students, we, we have even more women than the men, the proportion, like 70% uh, women and 30% men. So I think education really changes a lot, especially for the young generation in this country. This is very interesting thing here, yeah. Okay, I, I think that's really, we have some other questions, but I, I think they're gonna be a little bit, we're gonna run a little over, and I know Darren has to run um, uh, right on the dot. So I, I think that's all we have time for today. I just wanna say thanks to everyone for participating and for our panelists for agreeing to be up at all hours of the day and afternoon and night to uh, join in. And also for our, our participants, so many of them are in China right now as well and up quite late to- uh, Maybe they are women. <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah, because- <laughs> uh, so, so, so thank you everyone. Um, and we look forward to doing this uh, again in the, in the future. And this uh, has been recorded so we can, uh, if there are other questions, feel free to message us on any of the global network channels or any of our schools, and we'll do our best to uh, connect you where we can. Thanks, Thank everyone. Thank you very much. Thanks, Thanks Matt. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Thanks, Matt. Thank you. Bye. 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 Bye.